Today the Ascended Masters teach us the how-to of Taoism, and they illustrate the steps of the soul's self-transcendence through the chart of your Divine Self. It is the chart of the Tao, the De, and the lower self whose goal it is to attain bonding to both. The chart that you see before you shows three figures, the upper, the middle, and the lower figure. I see the upper figure as the great Tao, the central figure as the great De, and the lower figure, the lower self that is seeking to attain union with both. Our understanding of the great Tao is truly the first cause. Brahman, the universal being of God. As earlier we said, it is the fecund womb of the Great Mother containing all of cosmos within itself. The great causal body is individualized for each one of us. Lao Tzu taught this. Each one of us has that Tao. And so in this chart we see that Tao individualized as the Divine Self which is above the lower self in vibration and in consciousness. When the consciousness of the lower self begins to equate with that of the higher self, then the two become one because things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. We see then that the activating force of the Dur in the central figure is the point of the nexus through the activation and the action of der that is unconscious, perhaps first at first conscious and then becoming unconscious, that lower self begins to put on the levels of a higher way and a higher consciousness. The Christians talk about three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These are also illustrated on this chart. The upper figure represents not only the father, but the father-mother. It is the great sphere of first cause, or the causal body. The terms father-mother in Taoism are translated as yang and yin. In Taoism, in place of the concentric spheres of light that make up that body, you would see the symbol of the great Tai Chi, otherwise known as the serpent swallowing its tail. That great sphere of wholeness is the source from whence we descended. And the descent means the lowering of vibration, where we have lost the consciousness of this completeness and this wholeness, and therefore we are obliged to abide by rules of right and wrong, this and that what is moral and what is not moral. And these are relative states of consciousness. The central figure is the great mediator, and this is the meaning of the De. This potentiality of being, this seed potential that is a perfect pattern. That central figure reflects the image and the likeness of God to the lower figure. The lower figure being in the relative state as we are today, conscious of sin and not sin, is not able to perceive the absolute. And so the De has been sent forth. In Christian terms, the De would be the only begotten Son, not in the sense of a human being, but in the sense of the universal Christ. And that universal being, that mediator, is a step down or a going forth of an emanation of light from the great Tao above. The Dur then, until we have integrated with it, can be seen as our teacher. We can reach out for it because we know that ultimately our teacher is our real self or Christ self. The lower figure then attempts by meditation, by good works, 
by an active life of contemplation of the infinite, that oneness and that alignment with that inner self. The inner self mirrors to him his true identity. He can look in the mirror of the der and see how he should be because he does not know how he should be. And that's why he makes up rules of right and wrong. In communion with the der, the individual finds that point of equilibrium where he can be that der in action without being conscious of it. The merging of the lower figure then with the central figure in this chart is a daily walk in contemplation of the source that is sent forth, this mediator, to restore us to the whole. The Tao is not a personless, mindless, impersonal being. The Tao manifests the full personality and impersonality of the law and the lawgiver. We can know love from the great Tao, and we can know a loving, brooding presence that has lowered its vibration to the level of the middle figure and compels us to raise our vibration to the level of the middle figure. The middle figure in the chart is a level of consciousness that we had and knew in past golden ages when we had not gone out from the Tao and the Dur. Lao Tzu came to restore that state of mind. Because the lower self cannot enter that mind and understand that mind, the lines of the Tao De Jing are written in an enigmatic way, in a mystical way. Because we are being taught something that the limited capacity of the mortal mind cannot contain. And therefore, by the mystery and the enigma of the teaching, we are forced to not go through this mind to understand it, but rather to ap appropriate the very mind that contains it, represented by that inner self or Christ self as the middle figure in the chart. The great avatars of all ages who have come to liberate us have been the full embodiment of that middle figure. And they have been greatly overshadowed by and many times been bonded to also the upper figure. Therefore they have walked the earth with the shining halo of their own causal body, such as the Buddhas who embody the Dharmakaya. Buddhists call the upper figure in this chart the Dharmakaya. It is the highest body of light. We call the body the causal body and the figure within it that has identity, the I am that I am, or the I am presence. Holiness, then, is a successive putting on of the garment of the Dur and the Tao. And the Dur comes first because it is closer to us in vibration. Were we to attempt to now jump into the infinite sea of God's being, into the great Tao, we would be annihilated because we have not internalized it. Only those who internalize God, or the I am that I am, or the Tao, can merge with it without having the annihilation of personality and of soul. This wonderful teaching of Lao Tzu gives us an Eastern view of the ancient teaching which has been delivered to us today through the Ascended Masters. It is the teaching which Jesus Christ gave to his disciples and Gautama Buddha gave to his. As we contemplate these teachings, let us reflect upon the chart. Let us recognize that the flame that we see around ourself, represented in the lower figure, is an all-consuming flame, a flame we can invoke. It is the flame of sacred fire, the flame of the Holy Spirit. It is called the violet flame, and it transmutes or erases the state of consciousness that is less than the Tao. And we find that as that state of consciousness is effaced and is discarded by us as a snakeskin or a conch shell, we no longer inhabit it, 
that therefore a vacuum is left. The vacuum is created by this transmutation. And so the higher self descends because we are becoming more like that higher self in vibration. The higher self being the middle figure in the chart. Continuing with the analysis of chapter 38, Cooper says, no other system exposes and ridicules moral sham more ruthlessly or with more zest and humor than that of Lao Tzu. The Zhang Tzu, the Taoist classic attributed to the sage Zhang Tzu, says, to employ goodness as a passport to influence is an everlasting shame. It is useless to preach morality and charity and all the conventional virtues before reaching the heart of the example of one's own disregard for name and fame. After listening to a pious dissertation on the virtues of self-sacrifice and charity, Lao Tzu exclaims, What stuff! Is not your elimination of self a positive manifestation of self? I say to deny self is to affirm self. The dot in the center of the circle is the only place where self is and is not. If you have to eliminate self, then you have a self. Get beyond that. Go to that dot in the center of the circle, the equilibrium of the middle figure in the chart and the upper figure in the chart. Cooper says, Taoism teaches that virtue must also be an inward quality. The Zhang Tzu says, unless there is a suitable endowment within, Tao will not abide. Unless there is outward correctness, Tao will not operate. This endowment of the Tao is that seed potential. It is the flame of the heart, and it is the dir of the inner self, the real self that is the Christ. Cooper explains, the possessor of true virtue has no air of smugness about him, nor does he criticize others. Calton Marks comment on Lao Tzu's teaching on chapter 38 on the descent from the highest virtue to the lesser virtues of human heartedness, righteousness and propriety is. When human heartedness becomes a conscious activity limited to particular objects, it is degraded in its turn. A still more inferior virtue crops up, that is, deliberate generosity, righteousness, and lower still, ritual mindedness, when acts are prompted merely by a desire to make a handsome gesture by decorum and etiquette. The rites are indeed the opposite of the Taoist ideal. They were instituted to mark distinctions, divisions, and classes. Two biographies of Confucius that record a supposed meeting he had with Lao Tzu. These reveal Lao Tzu's position on propriety and rituals. Lao Tzu is said to have been about 20 years older than Confucius. Many believe these accounts to be legendary, but they nevertheless reveal the stance Lao Tzu would have taken. The first passage is, Confucius went to Zhou to consult Lao Tzu on rituals. Lao Tzu said, Those whom you talk about are dead, and their bones have decayed. Only their words have remained. When the time is proper, the superior man rides in a carriage. But when it is not, he covers himself up and staggers away. I have heard that a good merchant hides his treasures as if his store were empty, and that a gentleman with full virtue, de, appears like a stupid man. Get rid of your proud air and many desires, your overbearing manners and excessive ambitions. None of these are good for you. This is what I tell you. Confucius left and told his pupils, I know birds can fly, fish can swim, and animals can run. That which runs can be trapped, that which swims can be netted, and that which flies 
can be shot. As to the dragon, I don't know how it rides on the winds and clouds and ascends to heaven. Lao Tzu, whom I saw today, is indeed like a dragon. Chen writes, the meeting of Confucius and Lao Tzu was also recorded by the grand historian in the biography of Confucius. There, Lao Tzu gave Confucius the following parting words. I heard that the rich give gifts of money, the virtuous give gifts of speech. I am not rich. May I be an imposter of virtue to give you some gift of speech. Those clever with sharp observations, who yet are fond of criticizing others, are courting death. Those with wide and discriminating learning, who yet expose the evils of others, put their own lives in danger. As a son, avoid such pitfalls. As a minister, avoid such pitfalls. Chen says, Lao Tzu made it clear that the essence of ritual consists not in parading one's own merits or exposing other people's evils, which are the ways to death, but in being humble and yielding qualities conducive to long life. This is a familiar refrain also in the Bible. Pride is the way to death, while humility is the way to life. From Lao Tzu's speech, we get the impression that Confucius was an ambitious young man, full of zeal to cultivate virtue, eradicate evil, and above all, to be the savior of the world. This moral zeal, fired by the desire for fame and puffed up with pride and self-righteousness, was in need of a dressing down. The encounter with Lao Tzu proved beneficial. Afterward, Confucius was said to become more reserved and contemplative, while his disciples also made progress. This is the end of a quote by Ellen Chen. Concerning the same teaching on judgment, you know that Jesus said, Judge not, lest ye be judged. Let us take up chapter 38, line 11. As for propriety or ritual behavior, it is but the thin edge of loyalty and sincerity and the beginning of disorder. Ellen Chen says the word translated by Henrichs as propriety in its etymology means religious sacrifice. She says traditionally the author Lao Tzu was an instructor of rites, but the Tao Te Ching's overall attitude toward ritual is negative. In chapter 38, ritual, coming after human heartedness and righteousness, occupies the last stage of moral development such that it actually marks human alienation from the divine. We can clearly see this as so many people in our own time confuse ritual with true spiritualization of consciousness. There is more emphasis placed on the performance of the ritual than the content of the ritual. When we have both the form and the content, then of course the ritual becomes our self and it has a true meaning and a true reason for being in our lives. Chen says ritual behavior externally manifests an inner awareness of one's separateness from the divine. If you have to go through ritual, then you are saying, I am separate from the divine. Thus one treats the holy as the other with reverence and awe, and not as one's inner self and inner potential of being. In the deepest sense, rituals are designed to reconnect us to the divine. Standing on their own, however, they are mere appearance without substance or solidarity. The religion of ritual is the religion of the Pharisees, bordering on irreligion. That is the end of the quote from Chen. Cooper says that the Taoist view is that the stable, guiding lines of custom lull man into feeling that all is well without, while all may be ill within. She also explains how 
The Taoist idea of ritual sacrifice has to do with coming into harmony with the Tao. Coming into harmony with something means coming into the same vibration with. And if we look at the lower figure on the chart and the upper figure, the soul in embodiment and the I am presence, what we are saying is that the only true harmony between the two is when, through the middle figure, the mediator, the soul is able to raise its vibrations. The individual can raise the vibrations of the chakras and the aura to be now in polarity with the upper figure. And in that polarity, the middle figure is at the nexus. And you can see this polarity by drawing a figure eight. The upper figure is the Tao, the lower figure, the soul, and the state of becoming. But it all takes place through the mediator, which is the Dur, the real self, the Christ. Cooper says, in Taoism, there is no sacrifice to obtain pardon, no prophetic element which is bound up with anthropomorphism, and no prayers for personal favors. Any prayer must be for guidance to carry out the will of heaven. When you think about that, the prayer for guidance to carry out the will of heaven, if we will continue pursuing that prayer, we will become all of these things. By embodying God's will, we obtain pardon because we have eliminated the difference between ourselves and God. We have accepted his will. We need no prophetic element for we are within the will of God. We, know, we need no prayers for personal favors. We need no personal fa favors because we have chosen to embody the will of God, the will of the Tao, the law of the Tao, and God will give us that and teach us how to do it through that beloved teacher, the Christ Self. In the ritual sacrifices at the solstices, the emperor, as officiant, did not act the role of propitiator, but put himself in touch with heaven to learn its will and to offer gratitude for former guidance. The decree of heaven was the mandate of the king or emperor to rule the kingdom, but he forfeited this divine right as soon as he failed to act in accordance with the will of heaven. So too, ordinary man had to justify himself before heaven, but favors could not be bought, nor could heaven be influenced by sacrifices. Correct conduct was the means of putting both king and subject into conformity with the will of heaven, and so producing harmony in all relationships in the universe. And correct conduct is being centered in the dir, neither this nor that, neither left nor right, but centered. There was no possibility of vicarious sacrifice. As the Mahabharata says, sacrifice does not consist merely of material objects, which are only external. Essentially, it consists in that which comes from the innermost living heart. Hence, only the good man is able to offer sacrifice properly. As Ross comments in the original religion of China, the root of sacrifice is the heart. It means that man entertains in his heart no desire which is out of harmony with his true self, and that his outward life is in complete accord with the Tao. He seeks from sacrifice no personal gain, no private advantage. Chapter 38, lines 12 to 16. And foreknowledge is but the flower of the way and the beginning of stupidity. Therefore the great man dwells in the thick and doesn't dwell in the thin, dwells in the fruit and doesn't dwell in the flower. Therefore he rejects that and takes this. Arthur Whaley translates this. Foreknowledge may be the flower of doctrine, but it is the beginning of folly. Therefore the full-grown man that is full-grown in Tao takes his stand upon solid substance and not upon mere husk, upon the fruit and not upon the flower. Truly, he rejects that and takes this. Life is a never-ending process 
of choices, right choices, to take the enduring, the true, the balanced, and leave the rest. Every day we are saying, this, not that, this, not that. To do this, we must come into attunement with that mind of the middle figure in the chart that is the image and likeness of the Tao. The image and likeness of the Tao is the Dur. Ellen Chen says, For knowledge is knowledge through the art of divination. According to the Tao Dur Jing, divination is necessary only when humans have lost direct access to the Tao. It is better to never depart from the Tao and Dur, never acquire any moral consciousness, and thus never need recourse to the art of divination, which is but the flowering of Tao and the beginning of stupidity. When you become aware of the Tao as a thing apart from yourself, that is when the flowering of the Tao like the knowledge of the Tao, is the beginning of stupidity. When you know the Tao internally, within your own sense of being, then you have the foundation of true oneness and of the soul's bonding to the Tao. Regarding the phrase, therefore the great man dwells in the thick and doesn't dwell in the thin, Chen says, Nature or the unconscious is the thick, while virtue or consciousness is the thin. The Taoist's choice is the thick hidden kernel where life resides, not the thin flower pertaining merely to appearance. That is the end of the quote by Ellen Chen and the end of our commentary of chapter 38 of the Dir Dao Jing, translated by Robert Henricks. It is wonderful to contemplate the mystery of being through the lens of Taoism and the lens of the heart of Lao Tzu. Let us continue to do so as we look at life in a new dimension, existence here below and as above. I commend you to the Tao Te Ching, I commend you to your heart's meditation on the reality that is within you. You're watching Elizabeth Clare Prophet, world-renowned author and founder of Summit University. Summit University is located at the beautiful Royal Teton Ranch in Park County, Montana, just north of Yellowstone National Park. If you'd like more information, call 800-323 5228. That's 800 323 5228. In my last lecture, I took up the teaching of the 6th century BC Chinese sage Lao Tzu recorded in the sacred scripture of Taoism, the Tao Te Ching. In our study of chapter 38, we learn the significance of two central concepts in the Tao Te Ching, the Tao and the Du. The Tao is the all-pervading principle of the universe, the first cause, the absolute. Du, commonly translated as virtue, is inner potency or the power of the Tao in man. It is also natural goodness that is the result of the Tao functioning in man and in the universe. We also learned about the qualities of those who have superior de, that is, superior virtue, hence power. The person with a superior de does not proclaim his good works. He is not smug about his accomplishments. He is not concerned about outward propriety. His virtue is an inward quality. Above all, his power and goodness come naturally. 
As it were, they are part of the very fabric of his being. Today we turn to chapter 39, where Lao Tzu describes how the Tao undergirds everything that exists, and how without the Tao, nothing can exist. First, I will read to you Robert Henrik's translation of chapter 39 in full. Then I will give you the interpretation of scholars and my own commentary. And so Lao Tzu writes, Of those in the past who attained the One, heaven, by attaining the One, became clear. Earth, by attaining the One, became stable. Gods, by attaining the One, became divine. Valleys, by attaining the One, became full. Marquises and kings by attaining the one made the whole land ordered and secure. Taking this to its logical conclusion, we would say, if heaven were not by means of the Tao clear, it would, I'm afraid, shatter. If the earth were not by means of the Tao stable, it would, I'm afraid, let go. If the gods were not by means of the Tao divine, they would, I'm afraid, be powerless. If valleys were not by means of the Tao full, they would, I'm afraid, dry up. And if marquises and kings were not by means of the Tao noble and high, they would, I'm afraid, topple and fall. Therefore, it must be the case that the noble has the base as its root, and it must be the case that the high has the low for its foundation. Thus, for this reason, marquises and kings call themselves the orphan, the widower, and the one without grain. This is taking the base as one's root, is it not? Therefore, they regard their large numbers of carriages as having no carriage. And because of this, they desire not to dazzle and glitter like jade, but to remain firm and strong like stone. That is the end of chapter 39. So now we will consider its meaning. The first line says, of those in the past that attained the one. Arthur Whaley translates this as, as for the things that from of old have understood the whole. Whaley says the text literally reads, as for the things that from of old have got the whole. He says the got does not mean attained, but got the idea of. As for the things that from of old have got the idea of the whole. This is why he renders the phrase, got the one or whole, as understood the whole. As I continue comment on these verses, I will read from Winsit Chan's translation. It is similar to Henrik's, but smoother. Chapter 39, lines 2 through 12. Again, these are the same lines by Winsit Chan. Of old, those that obtained the one, heaven obtained the one and became clear. Earth obtained the one and became tranquil. The spiritual beings obtained the one and became divine. The valley obtained the one and became full. The myriad things obtained the one and lived and grew. Kings and barons obtained the one and became rulers of the empire. What made them so is the one. If heaven had not thus become clear, it would soon crack. If the earth had not thus become tranquil, it would soon be shaken. If the spiritual beings had not thus become divine, they would soon wither away. If the valley had not thus become full, it would soon become exhausted. If the myriad things had not thus lived and grown, they would soon become extinct. If kings and barons had not thus become honorable and high in position, 
they would soon fall. Translator R. B. Blackney comments on this chapter. The use of the one is, of course, a synonym for the way or the Tao. It indicates the unifying character of the way. This poem is an assertion that the way is imminent everywhere. Wing Sit Chan says that the one, also referred to as the Great One, is equivalent to Tao but has different connotations. Tao denotes the way, the principle. The one, on the other hand, denotes unity and simplicity. The uncarved block before it is split up into individual things and the number that is not relative to other numbers. It is things merged into one. It is consciousness without division. It also denotes the beginning and the origin of things. Zhang Tzu used the concept of the one in still another sense. He described it as the synthesis of all opposites. He says, the universe and I exist together, and all things and I are one. That is a beautiful Taoist mantra. Let us give it. The universe and I exist together, and all things and I are one. The universe and I exist together, and all things and I are one. The universe and I exist together, and all things and I are one. According to him, all distinctions and contraries are combined by Tao into one. For us, this is equilibrium of yin and yang. Holmes Welch writes, the chapter is Lao Tzu's clearest definition of Tao as the order of the universe. It is the law of nature. Tao is not identical with the universe, and yet it is at work everywhere within it. Tao is impersonal and beyond the reach of prayer. In the West, mystics generally regard God as personal, while most Eastern traditions regard God as impersonal. I don't believe that the Tao is beyond the reach of prayer, and I don't see how anyone could so circumscribe the limitless Tao. Eastern and Western traditions see God as both personal and impersonal. The impersonal aspect is reflected in the Tao and Brahman, but the, personal, but the personal aspect is seen in myriad Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and the Hindu pantheon of gods and goddesses. And so we can pray to an impersonal God and a personal God. In the West, God the Father is impersonal, but God the Son is personal. Saint Germain gave a teaching. He said, Father is the impersonal impersonality. The Son is the impersonal personality. The Mother is the personal personality, and the Holy Spirit is the personal impersonality. To me, that sounds like a bit of Taoism all in itself. Translator Ellen Chen says, the central theme in the previous chapter, in order to be what it is, a being must revert to its origin, is elaborated in this chapter. Every being becomes what it is by returning to the one from which it comes. In this chapter, the one is what endows everything with its specific nature so that it is what it is. Just as among numbers, the number one is the smallest, and yet the beginning and foundation of all numbers, so the one is Tao. It is the great creative ground coming forth as the small to become the world, 
which is the great. The meaning of the one is consistent throughout. It is the humble and small, born of the nothingness of Tao, to serve as the ground of all beings. The He Shanggeng commentary calls the one the child of Tao. The one born of Tao is the seed of all beings by determining all beings to be what they are. This brings us to the concept of Christ. I see the child of the Tao as the equivalent of the only begotten Son of God, in whose image and likeness we are made. It is the universal Christ individualized for each one of us in the person of the Holy Christ Self, also shown in the chart of your divine self. So the one is born of the Tao, even as the Son, one manifestation of the universal Christ, came forth from the Father, or as we would say, the Father-Mother God. The seed of all beings, it is like the seed of Christ, or the seed of Buddha, that resides in all of us. And as we nourish the seed, we become the fullness of that seed. It is the image of Christ that God made that determines what we are and what we are to be. We do not see the only begotten Son as confined to Jesus in the orthodox Christian sense of the word. We see Jesus as the full incarnation of that one because he became one with the great Tao. And by his example, we can become the incarnation of that one that was born of the Tao. Here is where the great mysteries of Christ converge with the mysteries of Lao Tzu. The one is the germinal seed of all beings. Through the one we become who and what we are meant to be. If you pause a moment and meditate and feel what you feel as the seed of God, it is the point of identity. It is like the center of a great spiral of being. And because that seed is at the center of our being, we know we can fulfill the full potential of that seed. And that seed goes back to the sense of potency, the potency of the Tao. Through the one we return to our point of origin, which we call the great central sun. The great central sun can be called the great Tao. Chen continues her commentary. All the great creative forces in the world become what they are by attaining and preserving the one as the core of their being. Heaven is clear, earth is peaceful, spirits are efficacious, valleys are replenished, all beings come to be, and rulers bring order to their states. This dynamic, organic, rich, and actively transforming world has its secret and origin in the smallest of all, the one. So is the seed of Christ the smallest, but when it comes to full fruition, it is the consciousness of the cosmos. Until you discover this seed and have the sense of that point of contact in yourself, you may lose sometimes the sense of being centered, centered in a divine reality, centered at a point of seeing and knowing of purpose and will and decision-making. That point, that nucleus, is the divine gift. It is the divine spark of being without which we could not realize the Tao or our own being. Let us continue with chapter 39, lines 13 to 16. Therefore, humble station is the basis of honor the low is the foundation of the high. For this reason, 
kings and barons, call themselves children without parents, lonely people without spouses, and men without food to eat. We remember the reference to Melchizedek without father and mother, beginning or ending of days. Perhaps rather than being literal, this may mean that he was the full manifestation of the Tao and therefore no longer had a reference point to beginnings and endings. And so, Lao Tzu says, is this not regarding humble station as the basis of honor? Is it not? Chen's comment on this is, the social political order is an extension of the natural order. Those who occupy high positions, kings and barons, must embrace the small and humble. That is, the one. If they are to be ontologically grounded, ontologically grounded. Ontology, as you know, is the branch of metaphysics dealing with the nature of being, reality, or ultimate substance. So if we are to be ontologically whole, we have to enter the one. To be orphaned or widowed is the most miserable fate. This is how a ruler refers to himself to show that he embraces the humble within himself. A king referring to himself as Puku, meaning he is not worthy of his title, is like a Christian ruler who calls himself a sinner. James Legg and other translators render this passage differently. Legg's version reads, Princes and kings call themselves orphans, men of small virtue, and as carriages without a knave or hub of a wheel. Is this not an acknowledgment that in their considering themselves mean, that is lowly, they see the foundation of their dignity. Chen translates it as, Therefore, barons and kings call themselves orphaned, widowed, and unworthy. Is this not taking the humble for one's root? Is it not? Legg's interpretation of this is, The way in which princes and kings speak, depreciatingly of themselves, illustrates how they have indeed got the spirit of the Tao. What I understand from Lao Tzu's teaching is that the foundation of the dignity of the princes and kings comes from their humility. We can see in politicians today that there is no true greatness where there is not true humility. True greatness comes from realizing your smallness and letting yourself be filled with the greatness of the Tao. You have to be nothing before you can become something. It is like the process of the self-emptying of the things of this world that one may be filled with the things of the spirit and nature abhors a vacuum. Line 17 of chapter 39 has been subject to many different interpretations. Whaley translates it as, enumerate the parts of a carriage and you still have not explained what a carriage is. He says the argument here is that the whole cannot be known by separately knowing the parts. R.B. Blackney simply translates it as, truly a cart is more than the sum of its parts. Henricks offers another variation. He translates it as, they regard their large number of carriages as having no carriage. Other translators believe that the word carriage is a corruption of the word fame or praise, and that the original probably was meant to be fame or praise. Thus Chen and others translate this passage, therefore the most famous has no fame. He has become famous because he has no sense of fame, no desire for fame. Victor Mayer, using the same Ma Wang Dwe manuscripts as Henrik's, translates it as, striving for an excess of praise, one ends up 
without praise. These days we see politicians scrambling on top of politicians for fame and praise. And they all fall down and they all look silly. The last two lines of chapter 39, lines 18 and 19, are translated by Whaley as, They, the sages of old, did not want themselves to tinkle like jade bells, while others resounded like stone chimes. He says this passage deals with a reluctance of the wise ruler to put himself above his subjects and so spoil the unity of empire. Chen translates the end of chapter 39. The most famous has no fame. Do not tinkle like jade or chime like stones. Legg's translation is, princes and kings do not wish to show themselves elegant looking as jade, but prefer to be coarse looking as an ordinary stone. Chen says the intent here is instead of advertising oneself, it is better to hide among the fameless. Do not chime forth loudly like jade and stone pieces in musical bells. The sage covers up his jade under coarse garments. My meditation on chapter 39 of the Tao Te Ching has opened for me new levels of understanding of the words and deeds of Jesus Christ. We all know these words and stories by heart, so much so that their meaning has been neutralized. But Lao Tzu's teachings give us a bright new dimension of what was in the mind of Christ when he thus spoke. In chapter 39 of the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu teaches, The noble has the base as its root, the high has the low for its foundation. Jesus understood that only the meek and humble who embrace the base, which is the one or the Tao, can reach to the heights. He not only taught this, but he exemplified it in his own life over and over again. It is amazing how many passages I have found that are pure Taoist in their statement right out of the four Gospels. Jesus preached, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. First of all, let us define our terms. The Oxford English Dictionary defines the word meek in the sense we are using it as gentle, courteous, kind. To call a superior meek means he is merciful, compassionate, and indulgent. As connoting a Christian virtue, meek means free from haughtiness and self-will, piously humble and submissive patient and unresentful under injury and reproach, inclined to submit tamely to oppression or injury, easily put upon. Of animals, it means tame, gentle, not fierce, not violent or strong, mild and gentle. The Oxford English Dictionary defines lowly as humble in feeling or demeanor not proud or ambitious, humble in condition or quality, modest, unpretending, low in situation or growth. Jesus is saying, ye shall find rest for your souls because I am the base. My yoke is easy, my burden is light means because I have taken upon me the Tao as my burden of light, Therefore, my yoke is easy. My dir is easy. The activating principle of virtue in me is easy. Because I am meek and lowly, I carry the Tao. 
one must be meek and lowly to allow oneself to be ridiculed, to be crucified, and to become the burden bearer, the servant of all. And yet through all of this, Jesus is teaching us that this is the lesson not only of Christian virtue, but of the science of equilibrium, of the law of nature. If you walk as I am and do as I am, you will receive power from on high. For more information on the mystical paths of the world's religions, call toll-free 1-800-323-5228. The preceding program was presented by Summit University, Box A, Livingston, Montana, 59047-1390. If you'd like to know more, call this number or write this address. For your free copy of Elizabeth Clare Prophet's best-selling book, The Human Aura, call this toll-free number, 1-800-323-5228. This is a limited-time offer, so call now for your free book. That's 1-800-323-5228.